kids start to butt heads? How do you deal with that situation as a caregiver? Anybody? Come on. <laughs> okay, so the first thing, well, one of the first things that you should do is to, in de-escalating that situation, is to remove both kids, right? Identify what made the board start in the first place, and then put each child has to have a certain area where they can go to de-escalate themselves. For Nathan, we try to teach him at home breathing techniques, and that makes it easier for us because then we're able to relate to you, the caregivers, that what helps him is to breathe. So you have this constant communication open between you, the caregivers, and us, the parents. If it's a situation where a police may not understand that a child is autistic, how do you, as a caregiver, say to that police officer, this is an autistic child? Because the, the, the autistic child, they don't know boundaries. They don't know what is harmful, right? He might see, and I'm gonna use Nathan, he might be walking and he will, he was fascinated with firefighters and police cars at a point. And he could have, he could well have been walking in the mall or somewhere. He sees a police officer and he reaches out to touch the back. It, it could end badly because this officer might think this child is trying to grab my gun or something. So it's really important that not only us as educators and parents alike, that we're aware of these situations, but also our law enforcement as well. Some, some behaviors can be misunderstood in the example for reaching to touch the officer's back. So what we find normally happens to us when we go to restaurants is that Nathan refuses to leave a restaurant if he sees a baby. If a baby is crying, it touches an emotional cord inside of him and he wants to go over and he wants to soothe that child to say, why is the baby crying? He has to, there was a point when this lady was in the restaurant and we were leaving and we could not leave unless he went over. And of course I had to go with him and I had to say to the family, I'm sorry, is it okay, sorry to disturb your meal, is it okay for my son to say hi to the baby because he refuses to leave, right? So there are certain instances when as parents, we have to develop this communication and it, it, the dialogue has to start with us because we send our kids to you and if we hold anything back, then you don't know how to treat certain situations. When possible, be prepared for situations that could lead to behavioral difficulties. When we were in the States, Nathan had a friend who was in a wheelchair. And the teacher used to tell me all the time that Nathan was so, he was such a friend to this little boy, to the point where they would be in class, he would notice that this child is mm, smiling. He would walk over to him and give him a hug and say, Spencer, everything is gonna be fine. And I couldn't understand how Nathan wanted to play with this boy. So I put a note in Nathan's backpack, told his teacher, the teacher passed it on to the guy's parents. And when the mother reached out to me, she, she was crying. She said when she got the note, she cried because she couldn't, no one has ever wanted to have a play date with her son because he was in a wheelchair. But that's one of the traits of an autistic child. They're very loving human beings. Same friend, they were in a resource room together and the child in the wheelchair kept pushing away Nathan's chair and Nathan kept saying to him, make good choices, stop pushing away my chair, make good choices because we try to teach him to make good choices, right? The guy would listen. The next thing Nathan took the chair, smack in the back of his head. There was a little blood. But when both parents got to talking, the mom said to me, it's okay, I understand. Because from what I hear, I know that my son was the aggressor. 
but it's not in every situation that you're gonna get that lucky, right? He attends St. Bernadette. A few weeks ago, the principal called me, and I'm like, I'm at work, I see St. Bernadette on my phone, and I'm like, oh dear Lord. My coworker said, what, what's wrong with Nathan? And I take the call and she said, Mrs. Nelson, and I tell him every time you call me, the first thing you say to me is, Nathan is fine, yeah. right? Because I don't want to freak out. And she says, Nathan is okay, but there was an incident at recess, and this guy apparently called him skinny. He doesn't like the word skinny. And the next thing, he put the guy's head in the wall. So, both kids were called to the principal's office and they spoke about it, they apologized. But it's in that moment that he cannot control his actions. So it's having that ability to determine when an autistic child is escalating to certain levels and when it's time for you as a caregiver to step in and say, okay, right now I hear Miss Shannon is not his best friend because they were supposed to go outside and he was doing something and she took him into a room and he said, Mom, Miss Shannon locked me in a room. <laughs> I'm like, Nathan, she didn't lock you in the room. She was just trying to protect you, right? So he has to finish what he's doing. If he's doing an activity, he has to finish that activity. Have a plan for when problems occur. Know the early signs of a problem behavior. Get to know the people who work in the places you go to frequently in the community so they can be helpful. If we take Nathan to church and he's going to go to children's school, the first thing I say to them, I just want you to know he's autistic. We speak openly about him being autistic. However, we find that not every parent will speak as openly as we do. But it's our reality. When I'm at work and I tell people about Nathan, and Nathan did this and Nathan did that, and I'm like, but he's the sweetest, smartest child you ever meet, right? Safety and identification. The person may not know how to move around in traffic, such as safely crossing the streets. So most kids, you teach them, look left, look right, look left again. If it's clear, then you cross. He doesn't care about looking at the look right. He just knows he has to get over the street and he's just gonna step out. The person may not understand the danger of going out with a stranger. The person with ASD should carry identification at all times. So we feel that if kids are allowed, I don't know, does it happen here where kids have IDs? I know in the States, they introduced something where a child can have a personal ID, almost like you go to get your driver's license. They're now giving kids IDs. If you want it, you don't have to. It's fine in high school. But yeah. Okay, well, I don't know. I know they were doing it for younger kids, because the picture they had in the DMV was there of a younger child. And it's just, it's just another safety precaution that kids are taking these days. Um, Identification information should say that the person may not be able to speak or may be too frightened to answer questions in an emergency situation. Chris is going to go over preparing for first response. It's very interesting. I love when my wife said, I was just a <laughs> That's what some people, when you hear the word blood and another child, it's like, you know. So we have this conversation all the time about you know, not worrying too much about what's going on um, with our son. But this is just an example of, you know, if an autistic child is in a store or in your care or you're in your environment and a call is made to a police officer or a first response person, who is going to say to them that the child is autistic? because they're going to treat that child completely different. Now, the hospitals, once you get there, or like sick kids where we've spent some time, are aware of how to deal with it. And it's not a pretty sight. 
because they would literally wrap him like a mummy just to give him an injection and they say to the parents you should go because you they have to wrap every part of his body just to get a little spot to give him an injection and in cases of first responders who don't know they're going to do things that may actually injure the child in the process as Tasha mentioned in the slide before the child in some cases cannot speak or does not want to speak so you have to look at having identification and again this is just a way of being proactive and saying to some parents this is how we should tag what they do the kind of tag that they should have on their clothes or the, the tag in case the child goes missing it's not a matter of it being somebody's fault it's a matter of being proactive and saying if this happened how can we mitigate or reduce the damage that could happen I would not be offended if my school said to me we want your son to have a special tag when he's there because he will go walking he will walk to Pickering Mall because he just wants to go and build a boat it's not anybody's fault he's autistic but if somebody finds him then how would we deal with it okay the latest estimates show that it's one in 66 individuals right here in Durham who are now autistic and that number is growing it's not going away more and more people are becoming or having autistic children for whatever reason we're not in the business of trying to figure out why or how it happened I mean we have four kids so we knew once Nathan was born something was up okay but let's deal with the reality of what happens some people spend the time trying to fix it some people spend the time trying to find a blame you talk about oh I'm not going to vaccinate my child or I'm not going to do this or it's organic food or it's this or that we don't know we leave those to the people Kennedy Krieger Center the scientists the DNA experts Nathan's aunt let me put it to you this way Nathan has several aunts and uncles we have not seen them in years we have literally had as one of his aunts is a top DNA scientist in the world in the world who flies around China everywhere and speaks at functions and she actually came to the house took Nathan for a drive three years ago and came back and just said I can't do this I love him we have never seen or heard from her from that day it is typical people cannot deal with an autistic child because they there is no cure grandparents leave the aunts uncles brothers and sisters who just cannot cope but then you being that person when I pick up Nathan and you give me that smile that's like wow no seriously you guys need to understand you're you've had a hard day too I know that but when I pick up my son and I see that smile and that interaction from you it means so much that I can get on with my work and he's in good hands and I'm not saying that you have to do this for every child but just understand that the parent of an autistic child needs a little bit more At home, door alarms are helpful to make sure the person doesn't leave the house. One of the things that we are going to be advocating is about putting on signs on doors. Because we believe that every institution that has an autistic child in their care should have a decal on there that says autistic child on premises. Other parents need to be aware that an autistic child is there so that if they see a child walking out, they know that maybe this child is autistic and shouldn't be leaving. Because that's how they walk out when somebody's not looking. We are more prone to put guard dog, warning, bad dog. But we don't want to talk about autism and put a, a sign that says autistic child on premises. People are not doing it with cars and putting autistic child in car. 
so that if you are in an accident, that the first responder knows the child is autistic. There are special seat belts. You are caregivers. Autistic child on premises. You need to be careful because you will have a dog. A person who can be walking past with a dog. An autistic child has no fear of a bad dog. They will run to the dog because there's a lack of common sense. So again, autism decals should be placed on doors and car windows to make sure that in case of an emergency, responders know that there's an autistic student in the vicinity. Think of it. If you had a fire at your school, you think your autistic child is going to run in the same direction and line up like everybody else? Responders need to know, yeah, we have uh, 50 students here, but we can't find one. He's autistic, and they'll know where to look or they have training, they'll know that. It's just a conversation because we're going to start promoting that and trying to get schools and restaurants to say, okay, this is the area that the child should sit in. Not because they're different, but you go into some restaurants, it's so loud, and the TVs are flashing and everything else, so maybe you should have an area. If you have an area for a disabled person to park or a disabled person to sit in a restaurant, why not have it for an autistic person? Because we don't want to talk about it. It's embarrassing. There's nothing embarrassing about myself. I have four. I could be with another Nathan, because I know when I get older, he's looking after me. <laughs> Take that much. <laughs> For those of us with older kids, you know what I'm talking about, right? When the phone calls stop coming. Right? Visitors should be aware that autistic students are on the premises. So we discussed that. Trigger signs and warning signs. You know when the autistic child is beginning lose it. Be aware. Change of voice, the tone, the arc, the angle. Do not confront, de-escalate. Breathe. With our son, breathe three times. Breathe. Every parent is going to be different. Find out from the parent, how do you de-escalate? <laughs> what are the different ways that you can de-escalate? Find out from the child how you can de-escalate. We always hold our hands first and say, I love you. I kind of melt it. We're going to add and say, I love you. Right? Social skill. There you go. So never assume that a student knows even the most basic social skills. So again, I go back to my analogy of going to a restaurant. Nathan doesn't know how to use a knife and fork properly because it's something that for him, I don't have time for this. So right now he will use a spoon and half of whatever is in the spoon falls off. The, you know, it's a back, back into the plate or on the floor or he's just using his fingers because for him, it's just too much at that time. So again, certain social skills must be taught. Nathan will run up to someone and say, hi, even taking him to Pride in the mornings. He'll see other parents, hi. He's shouting, Nathan, stop, hi. He's like, mom, I don't know what you're talking about. That's just who he is, right? So it's sometimes I have to say to the parents, hi, I'm sorry, that's my son, and just laugh it off. But you can see the annoyance on their faces at times when this child just runs up and hi, right? Um, another thing that I find or where caregivers can come in is understanding what is a tantrum versus an autism meltdown. As parents, sometimes I remember Nathan crying, and we're like, okay, we have to be at a certain level of understanding where, is he really crying because he needs something? Is he being just outright rude because he's not getting what he wants? And that's what a tantrum is. When you don't get what you want, then you throw a fit, and you cry, and you scream, and everything. But for an autistic child, 
having an autistic meltdown, it comes from just being overwhelmed, just being overstimulated. Sometimes Nathan will do like, just rub the side of his head, right? Because he's thinking so, so much that he's making himself overstimulated. And you have to say, calm down, it's okay. And as I say it's okay, that reminds me, never tell an autistic child that it's okay. Because for them, it's never okay. You have to explain, let's do this, and then we can do this. I know pride works a lot with us to try to understand ways to decompress Nathan. And one of those ways, because they know that he loves trains, well, toys aren't allowed at school. But because of Nathan, they're like, okay, let's do like a reward system for him. If you do this activity, then you get 10 or 15 minutes to play with your trains. And it's to the point now where I hear that he's sharing his trains with other kids. And then he's checking on them, are you guys okay? <laughs> because he has grown so much. But one of the reasons why that has happened is because we have been so vocal about it and because early intervention made a difference. The minute we found out when he was, when he first started preschool and his teacher said, you know, I think that we do need to get him tested because I noticed that he is gravitating more towards younger kids. We didn't take that as a sign as we don't have time for your son. So it's something that we seriously look into, right? And when we decided to get him tested, the it was a two-day process, and they finally said he was autistic. For me, it wasn't the end of the world, because sometimes we just look at each other and like, okay, what else is new? We saw parents there with kids who couldn't speak. So we're grateful, we're blessed that the only concern we have for our son is that socially, he's a little awkward. And if as caregivers we can identify that every child is different, then it makes our lives easier. And that can only come from engaging the parents and say, what do you do at home? And for the parents to say, to be, to feel free to come to you and say, how do you handle this at home? Because that's what we do. We go to the parents. There was this, um, Chris had taken it home once, this three color card system. Green, green, yellow, and red. So green is when you're okay. And I made these little tags, and every time he went to school, he would start his day off on a green. And I would give school a, a set of those cards. And as his day progressed, if they found that he was moving from green to a yellow, they would pin the yellow on and say, Nathan, you're going to a yellow. And he was like, does that mean I'm not supposed to go to the red? Because he knows what the red is. So social skills deficit is one characteristic that we will see in all students that have a diagnosis of Asperger's syndrome. This is an area that has to be addressed at every level and every age. Social skills must be specifically taught. These students are not just going to get it through observation and repeated experiences. So how can we partner with parents? I think I'm saying things before the slides, but again, it's with that constant interaction. The parents have to feel comfortable knowing that we can come to you, the educators, be honest and open with you, and you can be honest and open with us. Because at the end of the day, it has to do with the child that's in your care. And if you think about it, that child actually spends more of their waking hours in your care than with the actual parents because we drop them off, they spend how long with you? Seven, eight hours, even? And all we do is take them home, give them dinner, give them a bath, okay, it's bedtime, 
you sleep from that time to the next morning and you do it all over again. So you're like the parents away from home. So if the, if the conversation is not there and that openness is not there, then you're going to find that your day is going to be more stressful. <laughs> Our day is going to be more stressful because we're wondering what's happening at school. And then it causes more stress on the child. And then that's when all these behaviors come out even more because they're fighting back. When Nathan found out we were moving to Oshawa, he was like, but why do I have to move? Because now he's at a stage where he's feeling some form of normalcy and he's making friends and his friend Tai Tai and you know, what has given him Comfort is the fact that one of his friends now, they're also moving to Oshawa, and it so happened that they're gonna be going to the same school. So I called the principal and I'm like, you know, this little guy is moving too. By any chance, can they be in the same class? Because at least that will give him some familiarity with someone who's already accustomed. <laughs> so every child is an individual with unique abilities, challenges, and learning styles. <laughs> The best teachers learn to create lessons that appeal to all their students, keeping everyone interested and engaged. Among populations of typical kids, students' capabilities can be assumed to vary within a certain range. They'll be more likely than they are different. Autistic children may exhibit common mannerisms or learning difficulties, but the variation in behavior and abilities is typically much more pronounced than among typical children. Parental input is valuable, as I said again. Engage the parents. Find out what works for them at home, and then you put it into your plan at school. Pride, I know they have, they're putting a plan together for Nathan, based on everything we have told them. The school body